This story begins in Pennsylvania more than 70 years ago with births in two very different families. Mark Ciavarella was born in the poor, tough area of Wilkes Bar to a brewery worker father and a phone operator mother. He stayed there and rose to be elected as a Luzerne County judge, presiding over juvenile court. Michael Conahan was born in Pennsylvania as well to money. He also rose to be elected as a Luzerne County judge in the Court of Common Pleas. And at one point, he would become president judge with control and authority over the Luzerne County Courts. Local boys done well, right? No, not at all. This is not a tale of rising to power to raise up your community. It's a tale of corruption, one of greed and disturbingly one of selling off the lives of children in Luzerne County to detention for profit. It's a tale of a decades-long fight for justice and recompense and a story of 2,500 children who found themselves in the wrong courtroom a story of their families and their supporters. It was called the worst judicial scandal in U.S. history. That's pretty accurate. To date, there's not been a greater miscarriage of justice, a greater breach of the public trust. According to Wallace v. Powell, one of the civil cases that would follow the scandal breaking, in late 1999, Ciavarella approaches Conahan. The purpose of the meeting was to suggest that, quote, they bring together a team that had the financial ability to build a new juvenile detention facility, end quote. The court in that case is relying on Ciavarella's own testimony to reconstruct events. Conahan then puts a meeting together with Robert Powell, a friend and wealthy Pennsylvania attorney. Another meeting brings in Robert Miracle, who acquired property for a juvenile detention facility in Pittston, Pennsylvania, Power and Miracle form a company, PA Child Care, to build it. Initially, financing was a problem. Lenders wanted to know that they're going to be repaid, right? Reasonable. So Powell tells Conahan that unless there was an agreement, the facility would not be built. Conahan would become president judge in January 2002, so the parties waited. Once he became president judge, he signed a placement agreement, guarantee agreement, that stated Luzerne County Court of Common Pleas would pay PA child care $1.3 million per year in rent. So the lenders come through with financing and the facility began being built. But wait, there was another problem. An agreement was required not between the court and the center, but the county and the center to make payments to PA child care. This would require the signature of Luzerne County Commissioners. The conspiracy conspirators, though, had a fix for that. Bonahan told the commissioners that the court would no longer send juveniles to the Luzerne County Juvenile Detention Center. He told the probation department to return the facility's license to the Pennsylvania Department of Child Welfare. He effectively ended any funding for the county facility, shutting it down. The commissioners felt they then had no choice but to enter into an agreement with PA child care. It wasn't just rent they would receive, but tens of millions as well for the care of the children. Savarella helped PA child care hire the employees from the county facility, helping to ensure that it would remain closed. Then the dirty judges paired up to appear on television in December 2002 to talk about the need to shut down the older facility, the one run by the county. There was a signed agreement backdated to February 2002 stating that Miracle would pay Powell a referral fee of a million dollars that was actually intended to go to the conspirator judges. An example of one kickback transaction was a direction by Conahan to have Powell draft a document that instructed Miracle to pay $610,000 to Robert Maddox. Matta gets the money on the 21st. On the 28th, he transferred the money to Beverage Marketing of PA Inc. That same day, that company transfers $330,000 to Ciavarella. Ding, ding, ding. On April 30th, and again on July 15th, two more wire transfers of $75,000 each were transferred from Beverage Marketing 
to Seattle. The second detention center, uh, Western PA Child Care, was built in July 2005. Another million dollars goes to Conahan and Sea Varela. More bogus transactions occur. In addition to PA Child Care is built in February 2006, for the privilege, the judges receive another $150,000. A business is formed, Pinnacle Group of Jupiter, controlled by Conahan and Sea Varela, to launder the money. Deposits to this company were explained as uh, rent prepay, arena prepay, rental and slip rental. Pinnacle received at least $590,000. They bought a condo together in Florida, the corrupt judges did, to help launder the money. Powell docked his boat there, and when the marina manager tried to take away the slip, Powell had his buddies in Luzerne County, which is clearly not in Florida, took care of it. While Luzerne County was running their juvenile detention facility, 31 to 38 juveniles were sent there each year. Between 2003 and 2007, Sierra found 217 and 330 juveniles to send per year. Had the juvenile crime rate jumped that high between 2001 and 2003? No. The increase was purely the result of greed. No disclosure was ever made until the fecal bits hit the fan of the judge's financial connection between the judges and the child care centers, Powell and the other companies, and the developer. Most of the kids affected did what kids do, crimes that maybe deserved a parental grounding, a talking to, a day or two without video games. They jaywalked. One mocked her school principal on MySpace. Some committed petty theft or truancy or even smoking on school grounds. One child was locked up for conspiracy to shoplift just because they were present when their friend shoplifted. Locked up. And for these missteps, they were often handcuffed and shackled immediately not given a chance to say goodbye to their families and hauled away to two for-profit detention centers, the PA Child Care Center and the Western PA Child Care Center. They were often not allowed to even mount a defense, and if lawyers did appear with them, they were often not even allowed to speak on the child's behalf. If they did speak or a probation officer spoke, they were dismissed by an arrogant and greed-motivated Siavarella. Most of the cases took a minute and a half, a minute and a half to three minutes, noted Judge Arthur Grimm, who was a juvenile judge who was assigned to review all of the Sia Varela cases. Three minutes max to take a child from their home for a petty offense and place them in detention. Perhaps in one of the most serious cases, Eric Stef Stefanski, was locked up for two years. He was only 12 years old when he lo was locked up. And his crime? Well, he took a joyride in his mother's car. He ran over a concrete barrier and damaged the undercarriage. No one was hurt, but to get insurance to fix the car, his mother had to file a police report. She even believed, she told 2020, that going to court might steer him a little bit and prevent him from getting into trouble. He had no idea what he was doing when he pled guilty, didn't know how court worked when he did that without any legal help. Two years is what Sierra and his conspirators took from a 12-year-old first offender. In another case, a child committed suicide when he was released. He had committed a very minor crime, and like Stefanski's case, his mother thought going to court would do no more harm than putting a little scare into her son. He was to receive a college scholarship when he was sent to a camp for four months and then to detention for 30 days. His crime was possession of drug paraphernalia. He lost the scholarship, was left depressed, and further, further legal troubles followed. Sandy Fonza, the mother in that case, let her frustration out on, as Sia Varela as he was leaving court. But even that drastic outcome doesn't seem to have changed Sia Varela's outlook. Siavarella went further in ensuring that he would have enough victims. He set a zero tolerance policy in February 2003 that required that all children who were on probation 
would be charged with violating their probation for any and all acts. Under this policy, probation officers lost any discretion they had in trying to help manage a child's behavior. It also meant that more children would have to appear in Sierra's courtroom. Children are vulnerable to the actions of adults to begin with. But these children were particularly vulnerable because they were pawns in a corrupt game, but also because some of them were suffering with emotional and mental health issues. One plaintiff in the class action suit that would follow would sum it up like this, quote, I feel I was just sold out for no reason, like everyone just stood in line to be sold, end quote. The trauma of what happened to them would be long lasting for many. One of the affected children keeps all of his mental health records so that the court could grasp why his behavior is erratic. The same person took uncontrollably during a routine traffic stop part of the trauma of what he experienced as a child. The centers themselves, ready for kids at the end of each day, were part of a gross conspiracy against the children that were meant to detain, that they were meant to detain and care for. The youngest child involved was eight years old, an age where in most of the United States and in Canada, a child can't even be charged with a criminal offense. There were a lot of red flags. In an interview with the Juvenile Law uh, Center by a reporter from the New York Times, the executive director at the time said they tried to raise concerns to authorities about what was happening as early as 1999. And that statement might be a mistake because the corruption in this case began in 2000 with a meeting between friends. According to the JLC website statement on the scandal in 2007, a frantic call from a parent led to JLC investigating the irregularities in the juvenile court. They found hundreds of cases where Siavarella sent youth who appeared before him without counsel to out-of-home placements. In 2008, the JLC petitioned the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to vacate the sentences of the kids and expunge their records, and that initial request was dismissed. There was a conspiracy of silence in Luzerne County, which allowed this to go on for so long. Employees in the two child care centers were told ahead of time how many children to expect on any given day, Lawyers told parents not to hire them as it would do no good. Probation officers could see what was happening to kids, but complied with Sierra It was less a conspiracy to help the judge and more a fear of reprisals and his authority, but still little to nothing was done. And they were right to fear reprisals. One judge who raised concerns was transferred out of his courtroom by Conahan. If a judge can't raise concerns, who can't? Probation officers were dismissed if they attempted to speak up, and so were lawyers. Not a one of the employees at the care center spoke up until the investigation was well underway. An auditor who raised concerns had a lawsuit filed against him. That lawsuit was sealed by none other than Conahan to ensure that none of the dirty deeds would become public. When the scandal broke and the U.S. Attorney's Office laid charges, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court would finally give the JLC action on their pleas. They vacated the sentences of the children and expunged the records. More than 6,000 charges, affecting more than 2,500 children who appeared in Siavarella's courtroom between 2003 and 2008 were reversed. At the time of that hearing, about 100 children in Pennsylvania would either be released from juvenile detention or they would be taken off probation. The others had already served their time. During the investigation and the criminal trials of the scandal, statistics were collected, which give an even clearer picture of the scope of the violations. More than 50% of the kids who appeared in Siavarello's courtroom had no legal representation. In those cases, 60% of the kids were removed from their homes and sent to one of the two facilities that were involved in the corruption. It was January 6, 2009, some nine years after that first meeting between Conahan and his old friend, that the U.S. attorney announced federal fraud and income tax evasion charges against the two judges. We have no information on just how long the U.S. attorney's office had been conducting 
public corruption probe. The original charges involved $2.6 million in kickbacks, but the acknowledged total is $2.8 million. They would, on the same day, file plea agreements from the two judges with a recommended sentence of 87 months in federal prison for both. According to the agreement, they were also to resign, consent to automatic disbarment, and pay whatever restitution was determined by a federal court. The federal judge, U.S. District Judge Edwin Kosick, that would receive that agreement handed back a big no to the defendants. He believed the sentencing submission was far too low for the crimes committed and their impact. He also noted at the time of the hearing, neither judge was really taking responsibility for what they'd done, and Ciavarella in particular was denying responsibility. This rejection of the agreement meant that Conahan and Ciavarella had a choice to make. They could withdraw their guilty pleas or accept a sentence. Conahan, who by now was 71 years old, entered guilty pleas in the end to federal charges. He was sentenced to more than 17 years in prison, but was released to home confinement early. He has about two, four years left on his sentence. Ciavarella, however, after the failed plea bargain, took his criminal charges to trial. He was sentenced to 28 years in prison, and he's serving that sentence in Kentucky. He was ordered to pay $1.17 million in restitution and another $1,200 as a special assessment. The amount seems to have been adjusted later to just under a million dollars. His projected release will be sometime in 2035. He's 75 now and will be 84 or 85 when he's out. Ciavarella will be supervised for three years once he's released. Both men have been removed from their judicial positions, obviously, and both have been disbarred. Robert Powell would plead guilty to a two-count indictment and serve 18 months in prison. Robert Miracle would also plead guilty to misprision, and that's when you deliberately conceal your knowledge of a treason or of a felony, in this case a felony. He received a $250,000 fine and spent a little more than a year in prison. But Ciavarella, the arrogant and denying, would appeal. After a minor win, three of the charges he was convicted on were actually outside the statute of limitations and so were dismissed. He would argue that he deserved to be resentenced and have his sentence reduced as a result. Though he was not used to it, Ciavarella should have acclimated himself to hearing the word no. U.S. District Judge Christopher Connor handed him another note. Quote, to be abundantly clear, if we were authorized to reduce the Avarella sentence, we would decline to do so. End quote. Judge Connor cited the abuse of pub public trust, harm to juveniles, refusing to acknowledge the scope of his crimes, and the fact that it involved bribery as reasons to maintain his 28-year sentence. The taxpayers in Pennsylvania already footed up huge bill in the investigation and the prosecution of these crimes. Taxpayers also fit the bill for the incarceration of the men and later for Ciavarella's supervision, sorry, Conahan's supervision. A grand total may never be finally calculated and they would foot the bill for Ciavarella's appeal as well. Because by that time, he was found to be indigent. Fortunately, under Pennsylvania's Justice Act, there was a cap of $6,900 on court-appointed attorneys. In the time between sentencing and 2022, the other figures in this scandal settled the civil cases against them in settlements that totaled roughly $25 million. The JLC worked with pro bono, that means without a fee, co-counsel to bring the civil cases against the judges and the other major figures involved. In 2015, a settlement of $4.75 million was approved to compensate at least 2,400 of the kids. PA Child Care and Western PA Child Care and a third company settled for $2.5 million, a fraction of what they were paid to care for the kids. Miracle, the developer, paid more than $17 million in settlement. He and Powell would also plead guilty to the criminal charges. Ciavarella would argue in some of these cases that he couldn't be sued because he was a judge. 
and judges benefit from judicial immunity. And that's true most of the time. But so judicial immunity means that judges cannot be sued for judicial acts. An easy example of judicial immunity. Let's say that a judge finds a person a million dollars and signs warrants that allow a sheriff to collect the money from the person's assets. If he was acting judicially, that is that the orders were legal, he can't be sued for having those assets seized, even if that causes severe distress to the person. The sentence was unduly harsh, however, punitive in some way, vengeful because the judge had a particular beef with the person involved. That person could argue that with the Court of Appeal, judicial immunity wouldn't cover every act that a judge does in their lives, only judicial ones. So judges who kill people during a DUI could be sued for wrongful death because the DUI action is not a judicial one. Vengeful personal actions aren't judicial ones. Judge Caputo in Wallace v. Powell made clear that what he thought of Ciavarella's immunity argument. Ciavarella was not committing judicial acts when he formed the conspiracy or when he hid money from the IRS or when he received kickbacks for sending kids to detention or when he worked to close down the juvenile, the county juvenile detention center. Judges further had held that Ciavarella was not acting as a judicial officer when he set his no tolerance policy for probation officers. He was not acting as a judicial officer when he compelled probation officers to change their sentencing recommendations. He most certainly was not acting as a judicial officer when he filed false paperwork, failing to disclose his illicit connections. None of those acts that he was were acts that he was entitled to immunity for. And so during the civil actions, judges were careful to ensure that those acts were accounted for, handing Ciavarella yet another note in his claims of innocence and immunity. Even this loss at the Federal Court of Appeal didn't stop Ciavarella from pleading for a reduction in sentence. In 2020, he asked the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania for compassionate release. He claimed that he was suffering from a number of medical conditions and that further time in prison would likely cause more suffering. The petition said that the suffering would be worsened with or without the pandemic. First, the warden of his prison denied his request and then the court did. Two more no's. <clears throat> in 2022, the last civil case finally ended. Though he managed he forced the matter to trial. Ciavarella and Conahan both waived their right to even take part in the hearing. So, of course, it was Ciavarella, arrogant and determined to declare he had done nothing wrong, eager to make public statements of remorse for his own situation, who took the matter to trial. He was the defendant who forced his victims and their families to testify yet again about his behavior, what they experienced in being taken from their families. The civil judgment itself, though it likely never will be collected, is mind-boggling. $206 million to roughly 300 plaintiffs. U.S. District Court Christopher Connor sent a clear message to others who might think that children should be objects to profit from, referring to these plaintiffs as the tragic human casualties of a scandal of epic proportions. He calculated that each of the plaintiffs should have $1,000 per day for each day that they were wrongfully confined, and then added another $100 million to the total for punitive damages. Punitive damages are granted by judges in some civil cases to say, this was wrong, you knew or should have known it was wrong, and you did it anyway, more or less. The civil trial involved a staggering number of witnesses. 282 of them, now adults, were children who appeared before Ciavarella in the years between 2003 and 2008. 79 of those were under the age of 13 when the corrupt judge detained them. 32 parents also testified to having their children taken away. A number of the original plaintiffs in the class action weren't able to testify, having overdosed or committed suicide in the time before the matter was finally heard. 
The civil judgment, as stated, will never likely be collected. Siavarella is in prison. He'll be there for a long time to come, probably until he's dead. Monaghan had been in prison until the COVID-19 pandemic caused jails and prisons all over the U.S. to release some prisoners to reduce the risk of transmission inside of prisons. The others involved settled their cases earlier. There's little left, and the defendants, as often happens with very large judgments, could declare bankruptcy to avoid having the last of their assets taken. It's unfair seemingly, but the judgment does send a powerful message and its extraordinary size also acknowledges the size of the wrong that these kids went through. It's nearly 10 times the amount the dirty judges collected in illegal kickbacks, nearly the amount that the taxpayers shelled out to the centers to care for the kids. It's a message that, at least in Pennsylvania, the public demands that those put in tr trusted positions work for them and not to line their own pockets. The wives of the judges, who apparently technically owned the Florida company that was used to launder the money and which owns the condo, are uncharged. Savarella's wife divorced him in 2013 and good for her. Donahan is living on home detention with his wife. As far as we can tell, the Florida condo was never seized because its value had fallen drastically. And in the end, Pennsylvania is working to redress the problems in their justice system that allowed Ciavarella and Conahan to scheme their schemes for so long. The now adult victims are working to recover in their ways as well, but they'll never get back to the kids who have died. It will be decades before public trust can be restored in the system, which two of its most respected representatives shattered. Thank you for listening. If you're enjoying these videos and you want to see more, please click the subscribe button and hit those notifications so that you don't miss any uploads. We appreciate you. Thanks.